a child, Gex Enter the Gecko helped to define my interest in the games I enjoyed, cementing a baseline for what I enjoyed in a game at a young age, and led me to developing a deep love and appreciation for 3D platformers and gaming as a whole. As an adult, A Hat in Time helped to redefine and reaffirm that love, creating a baseline for my hopes for all indie 3D platformers that would follow it, while reaffirming my passion for video games as a whole. With the recent release of Here Comes an Echo, I just wanted to take a moment to look back at Gear for Breakfast's first release and see now, a few years later, and with two DLC packs under its belt, just how well A Hat in Time is holding up. And furthermore, what its place is in a landscape where 3D platformers are starting to make a real comeback, with more and more games either being announced or releasing that take cues from the collectathons of old. A Hat in Time got its start as a Kickstarter campaign back in May of 2013, reaching its goal and beyond soon after and eventually raising just shy of $300,000 after asking for merely $30,000. The goal was simple, recreate the magic of past 3D platformers for a world where, at the time, there just weren't really many being made anymore. No, seriously, Nintendo wasn't even really doing true 3D platforms on the scale it used to. Of course, a simple idea doesn't necessarily mean simple to execute, and soon afterwards the planned estimated release date was pushed back, and back, and, well, back. The game would see many changes through its development, becoming far more focused as it progressed. Some ideas as well as the plot would be filtered down with characters being removed, both minor like this cute little enemy bush little guy, Oh, he's so cute, to incredibly plot important characters such as Tim, the CEO of Time, and this old dude, what the hell, my guy, put on some fucking pants, Jesus Christ, there's kids around, what? What's wrong with you? Going to having one hub world for the entire game instead of one for every chapter, removing concepts such as a time manipulation mechanic, or playing as an older version of the main character called Hat Adult. The first level in particular, Mafia Town, would see the most notable changes being the first level in the game that was worked on. It's honestly pretty unrecognizable between how it first looked and what ended up being in the final game. After many setbacks and memes about the game never coming out, A Hat in Time would finally release in October of 2017 on PC with releases on other consoles held off until a bit later, and a planned Wii U release just never surfacing, even if it did later get a Switch port. The game would afterwards see two DLC packs. Seal the deal first in September 2018, the DLC that turns kids into adults and makes adults weep like the baby men, followed by Yakuza Metro in May of 2019. Between both adding two extra levels, a pile of nightmares, challenges, don't worry, we'll get to you. Adding co-op with a brand new character, addressing some of the common complaints with the game, and... <laughs> multiplayer lobbies. <laughs> in its base form, A Hat in Time has five chapters including the final boss. Each containing levels telling a story involving the characters in that area. Ranging from taking down the Mafia, to doing contracts for a horror movie monster ghost guy to helping some birds make a movie in order to obtain your MacGuffins, in this case, timepieces, uh, Hat Kid and Bow Kid if you're playing co-op, can return home after accidentally dumping them all over the planet thanks to this mafia asshole. Each level is locked behind getting more timepieces in traditional kleptothon fashion, but you're only required to get 25 of the 40 in the base game to reach the end, so you're free to pick and choose whatever levels you prefer doing, though in my opinion, the best experience is seeing all these levels through in their entirety, and you'll need to pretty much need to pop into most of these levels at least once anyway. Beyond the regular levels, each chapter has time rifts, platforming challenges that are hidden throughout levels in different locations that may require you to replay a previously visited act to find. Think of these like those levels in Mario Sunshine, where you have those obstacle courses to go through just to get to the end. They're pretty similar. Oh man, I feel like I'm gonna be saying that a lot, aren't I? Beyond that, you also have yarn balls to collect, which can be used to make hats. Each hat offers a different ability to help you get around or solve puzzles to get to otherwise inaccessible areas, with the cost going up depending on how late in the game you are. You can even get skins for them too, oh man, look, it's adorable. These hats sort of act as gatekeepers to certain parts of the levels, for example, needing a sprint cap for this level or the brewing cap to get into this area. You may require a hat in particular to complete some acts in prior levels you'd visited. For example, this race where you have to use the time stop hat to compete with this cheating asshole. Oh my god, I'm gonna kick his pecking ass when I get my hands on that little- Ooh, not quite the same after the last video. Anyway, beyond the yarn, you can also acquire badges, which will augment either Hat Kid or one of her hats, providing more speed, faster hat swapping, the ability to hover, whatever the hell this is, the ability to knock bonk your dumb head, or just make it so you fucking die in one head. Why not? It's your fucking funeral, man. Like, why not make it so your eyes bleed too? What do I care? I do care. I do care. What are you doing? Some of these badges can be found throughout areas and levels, but others can only be obtained from a badge seller, and he's, well, he's seen better days. The thing worth noting with the badge seller is that you'll only sell three badges or items at any given time, so you may be required to backtrack a little bit to previous levels, especially early on if you're running a little short on pawns. 
A few of these badgers are pretty critical to beating the game as well, and I dare argue the hookshot in particular is so required I'd almost wish they had made it just the default ability of Hat Kid in general, rather than requiring you to use a badge slot on it. Honestly, I feel pretty similar about the no-bonk badge, but I think I'm just tired of hitting my dumb head on things. That said, you can also just use all your pawns, this game's currency, by the way. On cute variations of hats you have are different color palettes for Hat Kid, which is definitely worth it, just look at her. Speaking of, upon completing certain missions, or by using a machine on the ship that takes Rift Tokens, these MacGuffins floating around levels, you use a slot machine-like thing and get even more customizations for Hat Kid or even remixes of in-game music, which can then be replaced if you prefer it to the regular versions. It's pretty neat. From the beginning, you only have access to the first level, Mafia Town, which, like all the other levels, will be accessed through one of the telescopes situated throughout different rooms of your ship, this game's hub world. Side note, it's actually pretty worth exploring the ship, honestly. There's tons of cool easter eggs, including Hat Kid's diary, which will display your snarky opinion of whatever level you just completed. It's pretty cool. And the music for this area was done by Grant Kirkhope, you know, the 3D platformer guy. He's responsible for a lot of rare soundtracks for its platformers, and it's a pretty cool touch, and it's the second 3D indie platformer I've covered on this channel that somehow featured him. Once you get into Mafia Town, you're introduced to Mustache Girl, a resident of Mafia Town, and your new best friend forever. And also a level that would spawn Mario Sunshine references in YouTube videos until the end of time. Pun intended. This first level acts as sort of a tutorial, with Mustache Girl running away from you and you following behind, and it's a pretty good way to get used to the controls, and may I say, these controls are buttery smooth. Just everything feels so right. They really nailed down a pretty simple to understand control scheme, and it leaves a lot of room for creativity, and I really appreciate it. Some argue that the double jump sort of makes the game a little bit too easy at points, but honestly, what did you expect? Dark Souls and platformers? Yep. After following Mustache Girl for a bit and killing some mafioso with your now reclaimed umbrella, you establish your friendship, and you get your MacGuffin. Congrats. Now do it again. Each chapter has a handful of normal levels with a story being told, culminating in a boss, and for Mafia Town, your mission is taking down the Mafia Cooks. They really like cooking. Why do I have this in my nose? Leading you to a battle with the mysterious boss, and after your long journey to retrieve the arrow, you know you're truly were- Oh, whoops, wrong Mafia. Anyway, you fight him, and you take down the Mafia Cooks, you fucking murdered the dude- Oh my god! Oh my god, he's dead! Jesus Christ! You murder your friendship five ever, and on to the next level, because good luck being this cheating asshole without the time stop hat, maybe this is a JoJo reference after all. Next up is Battle of the Birds, and I really love this world. It immediately throws a wrench into the level select you had in Mafia Town. In fact, I kind of appreciate that about every level. They seem to be unique in that regard in some way. With your actions tipping the scales in an award ceremony in one of two birds' favors. One being DJ Cruz, this cool disco penguin with an afro who struggled to win the award for best picture yearly since starting as a director with one exception, and his rival, the conductor, and... Nell? I think? I think? I don't know, it doesn't look like Noel I've ever seen Marl, right? Who has a love for trains, swearing, and trains. And you'll love them forever. Anyway, after the introduction to this world, hi Jontron. You'll be doing two missions for each of these birds, and you're free to skew things in the favor of who you want to win based off how you perform in the levels. For example, you can go out of your way to swear on live television, get cancelled on Twitter.com, or perform badly on this time challenge where you have to attempt to stop a train from straight up exploding. What is your own with you, Conductor? That's like the opposite of your namesake. What are you doing? Each bird's missions will have you completing a challenge, DJ Grooves having you perform with a marching band behind you who will damage you if they get too close, or doing a photo op with different people in a town area to get yourself more known. Meanwhile, the conductor has you stopping a murderer and stopping a train from exploding again. What is your problem? You also get cute thing fits for this level. Oh my god, this child is adorable. Look at her hats. After you finish this world and your bird of choice wins their big celebration, spoilers, 3, 2, 1, go, turns out the bird you showed preference to turns out to be a filthy peck neck and attempts to take a timepiece for themselves to alter time to their benefits using it. After a pretty fun little level going through Dead Bird Studio in the Dead of Night, cue boss fight number two. And this is where I realized my first playthrough, hey, these bosses are pretty good. This boss incorporates pieces of both birds' personalities, even if, in my opinion, it definitely feels more like a DJ Gru's boss fight regardless of who you're facing. With things like disco balls dropping, knives being thrown, just being stabbed in your general direction, saw blades, and dropping set props on you from above. And even if the arena you're fighting is physically the same, I do actually really enjoy the touches here. With the set pieces changing depending on who you're facing, where DJ Gru's boss battle has more of a disco theme and the conductive stage is a train car. Why is he skating those platform shoes? After a while, you have a sit-down chat with the bird that betrayed you. The conductor will reveal you intends to use the timepiece to undo his one mistake, the loss of Award 42. The one time he lost to DJ Grooves. Meanwhile, DJ Grooves is just like, oh, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna go back in time and undo every time I ever lost because I'm <laughs> he's totally cheating and I know it, darling. Man, I totally remember being pretty betrayed by this asshole when I was playing through for the first time. Like, I seemed so cool and he was actually a total dick and he placed a bomb and hack it. Oh, and he placed 
Bomb on hat kid. After this, the fight continues and the bird you betrayed with your subpar acting chops comes to save the day with comically large scissors, leaving you free to finish off the other. Another level done and you're onwards to the next wholesome, kid-friendly, totally not slightly spooky level. You. Subcon Force is living proof that you don't need to be a horror game to be actually horrifying. And the funny part is that it doesn't even fully start out that way, minus the whole insta-death you deny the giant purple asshole's contract. In fact, the first few missions are pretty by the book for it, and in all honesty, I actually really like this level's vibes and its platforming. And even if Snatcher's a bit of an ass, he's strangely endearing in a way, just deliver some letters, help a suicide cult, clean out a well, fight a sending in toilet. Oh dear god, what's happening? Look, Queen Vanessa's manner is honestly one of the scariest experiences I've ever had playing a video game, and I'm not afraid to say I bitched out and snuck up to the top floor via this hole in the wall. Man, have you seen this shit? Why is this in a kid's game? Oh my god. <laughs> I'm a grown man, child. And I still get freaked out about this. So spooky. Now, I'm sure it's mostly because I was caught off guard, but I'm also a little bitch and I didn't even complete this level the right way for the purpose of the video, so... Ha! After completing your contract for Snatcher, asshole that he is, he reveals that he wants all your timepieces, as well as for your head to pop off. And you guys fight! And fight it is! I actually really love this boss. He has an absolute bang of a song for his fight, the meta, I can't be hurt if I'm not blue bit, requiring you to dump blue ink on him to deal damage, the fact that you're slightly more vulnerable than normal because this smug shit stain just took your hat, leaving you entirely to rely on your platform abilities rather than, say, using the time stop hat to make things easier, and likely because I'm getting res flashbacks. Ooh, two Gex mentions in one video. hey -o! Anyway, after you beat him, he signs a legally binding contract to be BFFs, and you're on your way to where this ball of being the best things in sliced bread gets stuck in the toaster of life and we're going to have to shove a fork in it. Look, bad analogy aside, I don't really like this next level very much. Alpine Skyline is a pretty mixed bag. The thing is, this level makes really good first impressions in my opinion. This is such a cool fight to see and it's one of the more visually stunning moments in the game. It's such a shame that everything afterwards feels like it sort of falls apart a bit. Unlike other worlds in this game, Alpine Skyline is an open world level where you don't leave between missions. Fun fact, the original Mafia Town was going to be like this, but it would later be changed in development. The world split up in the areas you reach by these sort of zip lines, which are pretty cool. You can set a path you want to take on some of them, and there's pawns along the way to kind of make it feel like you're still doing stuff, even if you're kind of just zipping along for 15 seconds. That said, the overall feel of the level itself is a bit unfocused compared to the others. There's little overarching plot outside of these flowers, and there's no real driving force behind just getting your MacGuffins. Speaking of, each area holds a time piece and when you get them all everything goes to hell with a massive illness breaking out across the level causing massive destruction in its wake closing off some areas that aren't relevant to this final mission and having you dodge attacks from pissed off goats while trying to commit botany on some angry flowers no real boss here unless you include this which is sort of a mixed bag for me i kind of preferred the more focused bosses of previous levels but on the other hand i do enjoy what this level is trying to accomplish i will say that the change of tone and the almost urgency this last task has to it almost makes up for the rest of the level on its own but man it was a slog then and honestly it's even more of a slog now in my opinion and it really takes the wind out of my sails on a second playthrough that said if you're a real good boy and you complete all your other missions in every single other level including the time rifts you don't even need to go to Alpine at all if you don't want to. That said, there is yarn here, however. You might want to get it, especially if you want that last hat, however. That time stop's pretty nice. And that's it for main levels. But before I get to the final boss and the ending, I just want to talk about Nyakuza Metro pretty quick, because it unlocks at 25 timepieces, so you could do it before the final boss if you want, and it's Alpine Skyline, but better. This level was added as part of the second DLC pack, and it added a lot of stuff including stickers, new badges, and colors, and of course, the level itself. And it's pretty simple in concept, and shares its concept with Alpine Skyline, but does everything it tries to do so much better. With each area having actual dedicated story and urgency behind it after getting in bad with the Nakuza and needing to impress the Empress. See that word play? I wrote that. Throughout the level, you have a lot of things to use pawns on as well, either on Metro tickets to unlock new areas of the level to explore and get timepieces from, or food which is delicious and the right combination can give you extra health above your normal four. This helps make the level almost feel like there's a bit more of a progression to it than Alpine in my opinion. As you go, you eventually get access to the entire world and you get to see the different nooks and crannies of the Metro, and each timepiece will have you weave between areas above and below others you've already been to. This can lead to a bit of confusion on navigation, but it never really bothered me all that much. I never got too lost or anything. Something I really enjoy here is how free the level is to run the presumption that you have all the at this point, allowing for way more room to be creative with challenges in these areas, and it really makes the world feel like a actual final level in the game. After getting all the metro passes and collecting all the timepieces for the Empress, and by that I mean you, she thanks you very kindly by putting a $1 million bounty on your head and forcing you to book it. This boss is actually pretty cool, having you running through areas you've already become pretty comfortable with throughout missions leading up to it. Only now with more enemies than this crazy bitch with a rocket launcher chasing you. At points you even have to use her rockets to open doors to continue your escape. It's a pretty cool final challenge and it's a pretty cool world, and also you get a money pile! 
Man, I keep saying this, but I actually sort of wish that Nikusa was the actual final level instead of Alpine. It's such an awesome concept, right in line with the others, and it executes on a unique idea better than what happened in the base game. Not to offend any Alpine Skyline fans out there, just... Just my home blowing room. Oh, if you're looking for something extra to do, there's a hidden boss here. It's a nice nod to the Yakuza series. <laughs> nice. Now, once you have your 25 time pieces, it's off to the final challenge of the game. After lining up to be judged by Mustache Girl, talk to everyone. They have fun stuff to say. You go through a platforming gauntlet that's pretty cool, or I guess hot. Very, very hot. That kind of puts together everything you learned through the game to one last run. Remember how I said Yakuza benefits from knowing you have all the hats? Sort of similar deal here, except it doesn't really play into the time stop hat too much. It's still pretty nice though. And now for the finale. A bloody amazing final boss with all the characters offering to sacrifice themselves or offer assistance to get Mustache Girl to peck off and for some reason DJ Grooves doesn't talk here for some reason and it's always weirdly bugged me. Mustache Girl realizes that everyone's just kind of happy being an asshole and they don't want to be judged for it. You take like a peck ton of time pieces, oh my god, and boom. World saved! You get to choose if you leave Mustache Girl a single timepiece to help with her fight against the Mafia, and if you do, it gets sent out on the planet. And before Hat Kid can leave, everyone shows up making this giant person rope, begging her not to leave. Hat Kid pushes them off, heads out, and roll credits. Now, here's where I give my final thoughts on that sappy bit about how this game makes me cry and all that. But we got one more fish to fry. And I guess Seal. Seal the deal is a goddamn mess. There, I, I said it, I said it. It's. A bit of a problem. Arctic Cruise is bar none the worst level in the entire game including DLC and I will not apologize for my tone tonight. I love these old seal lads, they're adorable. Look at them and their ooh talk. <sighs> the big problem with Arctic Cruise is that it's only three acts. The first being a find the pieces mission which is okay but the second one is where things start to hit the fan pretty fast. This mission involves you doing a bunch of small tasks under strict time limits. Fail too much and you get to start all over again. With the layout of this level, it's very easy for the arrows trying to point you in the right direction to get confused, leading you the wrong way or just sending you in confusing directions. The individual tasks also run on their own time limits, so you're dealing with needing to get tasks done under two very strict time limits. And they're all random, so you can't rely on memorization, and the crazy part is, it used to be worse! Come on, lads! It got to a point where the actual patch notes for the game after a nerf say, and I quote, Ship shape, the Arctic Cruise has had its balance tweaked so that hopefully no player should be stuck on it for hours. And following this it would be changed again to make it even more easier. And after all that is still way too frustrating. I remember being stuck on this stupid mission for what felt like forever and wanting to pull my goddamn hair out and I don't need any more help with that. Anyway, the world finishes off with a mission where you titanic the ship, save everyone, and get stuck on the geometry a bunch, like seemingly a lot. I don't know, it's just me playing at like 5 a.m. or something, but I really don't remember getting stuck on this stuff as much the first time through. Look, what I'm trying to say is this level's pretty disappointing. I'm trying to find something I like about it outside of the seals and I guess more conductor awesomeness, but I, I can't really say there's much worth anyone's time here. I just can't say I enjoy this very much. Speaking of not enjoying myself, let's talk about Death Wish. So one of the biggest complaints about a hat in time on release was that it was way too easy. That us real gamers need a worthy challenge, and that this baby shit just wasn't it. So Gears for Breakfast collectively said, Hold my beer, oh god, that's why Ship Shape had me carrying so many beers, and made the greatest example of why you should be very careful what you wish for. Death Wish is 111 challenges, 114 if you count what was added in Yakuza, all of which are fucking brutal, oh my god. These range from completing a mission within an extreme time limit, to extremely aggressive band members, to doing every boss in a row without healing, to surviving against an aggressive form of an unbeatable snatcher, fighting both the birds at once, Toho in a 3D platformer. Look, this is actually psychotic. Like, who in their right mind is actually gonna try something? I did 74 of them. And I'm not doing any more of them, because Jesus Christ, just the margin for error on these is so slim, and each has bonus objectives too for more progress. You don't need to do them all in one shot, so you can do them across multiple runs, but man, it's still pretty brutal. And some of these pretty cool items are locked behind this, which means sadly for some people, they're probably never going to get to use, say, the Banjo-Kazooie themed outfit or the Nostalgia Badge, which are pretty cool unlocks. I guess it is a fitting reward for putting in all the effort to get some cool stuff, but oh boy. I'm not exaggerating, some of these missions would take up to two hours to complete on their own. The failure after failure after failure is slowly leading to some of the most salt I've ever 
dropped on a 3D platformer I love. Hell, when the DLC launched, Arctic Cruise had another issue where you needed to complete some death wishes in order to let you unlock more missions. That said, some of these missions would be nerfed later on to mixed reception, and Arctic Cruise would very quickly have its requirements removed, making it more accessible. I also welcome it a bit. Some of these fights were pretty unfair at points instead of just being tough as nails, and the changes kind of balanced things out a little bit better. Though I almost find myself still wishing they'd gone ahead and made the unnerfed version still available for an extra challenge. I kind of miss the whole Ultra Snatchers every boss at once thing. It's also worth noting that there's an easy mode for these challenges called Peace and Tranquility Mode. It was fucking awful at launch, just to the cost tied to it as it would eat up the few extra yarn you'd have after making all the hats. Why would you do that? But it's pretty alright now. You do get a different stamp for completing missions this way, but it's mostly a cosmetic thing and you still get the rewards. Hell, if you're a psychopath, you can go back and restart the contract later if you so choose as well. So you can finally get the sick cred for wasting years of your life trying to not die to this bullshit. A Hat in Time also features modding support on PC. Oh man, I can't believe I almost forgot to mention this. There's some pretty cool and extremely fucking cursed, oh my god, things being made by fans. Ranging from remaking levels from other games, to wall surfing by abusing the Nobong badge, to custom costumes and hats that in some cases totally revamp the game, to additional worlds with their own stories and timepieces, a nice little bonus. It means that even if you blast through everything, there's still going to be a reason to keep playing so long as there's fans around that keep making new, sometimes extremely cursed, content. The worry I wear mod made it so in half my footage, the Snatcher contracts all say I will only stream Fortnite and I only realize this after the third time seeing it. Hell, you can even play these in multiplayer lobbies, which is pretty cool, even if the online party mode is a... Oh, bit of a chaotic mess. Now overall, ignoring DLC, A Hat in Time is a slightly flawed game at times that manages to shine through those flaws with some of the most amazing platforming and charm I've ever experienced in a video game. The lows aren't too low, even with a bit of my bitching about Alpine Skyline aside, and the highs will actually stick with me forever. It uses love from everywhere, from the presentation to level loading artwork, to how you can get lore dumps through images that you can get from the time rifts that help you love the characters just that much more. It's this amazing package that I wish was just a little bit longer. Beyond that, it's just as good as I remember the first time. This game helped me redefine my taste in 3D platformers, and look, I wouldn't have like four Hat in Time t-shirts if I didn't like this thing. With the DLC, things get a little more muddy. Yakuza Metro adds a real final level to the game in my opinion, building out the base game in such a way that its inclusion feels so organic that it might as well have always been there, even with the insane multiplayer I'm adding to the experience. Seal the Deal is a dumpster fire in ways, but it can be a fun dumpster fire. You know, it's kind of like the kind where someone dumped fireworks in right before. It can be a blast, but it's also absolutely horrifying and I will never be the same after hopping into it. As a full package, I think it's definitely flawed, more flawed than the base game ironically, but with the exception of one level and unending war flashbacks, I think it's still a lovely experience that I'm happy to have had. I think there's something here for everyone, and seeing this almost renaissance starting with 3D platformers, I think Had in Time has not only done its part in influencing what would come afterwards, but also does a fantastic job standing on its own and showing just what Gears for Breakfast can do. Create an amazing 3D platforming experience, and in turn, in my opinion, it helped revive a genre that was sorely lacking at the time. I hope that as time goes on, Had in Time is still fondly remembered, except for you, you piece of shit, and others continue to see just how pecking amazing an experience this game is. Alright. I promise I won't get sappy at the end. Uh, Q hack it being like really rude for like 15 seconds and then the end card rolls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bye.